Okay, welcome everybody um, to this March meeting and many thanks to Tektronix and Steve Harms for uh, hosting us tonight. Um, we're going to learn quite a bit hopefully about how we do uncompressed <laughs> video over the IP network which is something we're all going to have to learn about. And hopefully uh, audio too. And hopefully audio too. The microphone's yes. not working. It's not meant to be, it's only for the stream. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's no PA on this one. Um, so, um, thanks very much for coming. There's plenty of food at the back. If you um, still feel hungry on the way out, grab another piece on the way out um, to uh, sustain you in the traffic going home. Um, thanks very much for coming, and over to Steve. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, just to uh, let folks know, uh, straight down the hall, on the right hand side are the restrooms just past the elevator so if anybody needs the facilities they're going uh, the other thing is the front door auto locks about uh, i think it was 6 30 or something so if you go out somebody's gonna have to let you in back in <laughs> you'll be out there keith's number is posted on the door if you need to get back in but with that let's go ahead and start this um, First thing I'll tell you is I don't have all the answers. This stuff is changing quickly. Uh, standards are going, uh, things are happening. I love questions, but I have no problem telling you, I don't know. So I'm just a uh, arms dealer, if you will, <laughs> selling <laughs> test equipment. <laughs> so let's go ahead. So, you know, IP really isn't anything that's new to the video industry. We started doing IP over 15 years ago. Now it was all compressed stuff, but we've been doing IP for quite some time. Uh, it's been in use. The compressed end of the business went through almost, not quite, but almost the same growing pains as we're going through right now with trying to get uncompressed video working across things they ran into all kinds of things you think about you know 15 years ago where switches were where the network was and trying to get you know upwards of four gigs worth of compressed traffic across things it was a little bit of a challenge at times and if you really th look at it you know why do we still use sdi i mean let's face it sdi works great it's a point to point you plug it in go it works phenomenal. It just doesn't have the density that we have the possibilities of getting out of IP. We're not quite there yet, but we are definitely headed that direction. So looking at this stuff, uh, IP allows us to use COTS, commercial off-the-shelf switches, there's a lot of caveats that you need to really be careful with with that. Uh, what most of the switch vendors have found out that they actually have to change everything they do inside the switch because this is not HTTP bursty traffic when the switch has a lot of time to go back and think of what it's doing. And really all an IP switch is is a statistical multiplexer. The problem is when you put gigs of flows that never change and never slow down and never stop it loses its time for its statistics so the vendors have had to go in and really rethink what they do for this industry versus a http style traffic when you've got time to make decisions the other thing is we can't space things too far video never stops it doesn't quit if we space packets too far, you're gonna drop data and that frame isn't gonna exist anymore. So there's a lot of weird things that can happen within video that didn't happen in the HTTP world. One of the things HTTP can knack and retrans, we can't do that. We're UT, UDP blast and never look back. So the network's gotta be phenomenal to do this stuff. We do have some challenges using this stuff. Latency, jitter, drop packet, timing. So they're not all insurmountable, but they are things that we have to overcome and be aware of, of what's going on. Uh, we do have 
a new waveform monitor. Most of us know we've got the prism out now. It is both an SDI and an IP product. So it can help all of us merge these two worlds because let's face it, SDI is not going away. Most of us that are dealing in the IP world are having to put converters on all the ends because 99% of everything we're touching is still SDI, except for the core route that we're building. It's going to extend into things and it will as we build things out. So this is a tool that has a whole boatload of IP measurements and the SDI side is built up pretty well right now but it is still growing on that side. We decided to build the IP side and pretty well build out the IP side because that was the tool set nobody has. Almost everybody doing video has got a waveform monitor that they can still grab and do things. So we're building that all into the product and it is an ever growing thing. So that's my whole sales pitch, we're done. <laughs> so we can do things in unicast which is sending packets from one entity to another entity and just between those two. Multicast, sending packets from one any entity to multiple entities. And then broadcast, send packets to everybody. So there's multitudes of ways that we can do things and we really need to deal with this stuff. So the SMPTE IP standard uses RTP with UDP sitting inside of RTP. So the user datagram is a unidirectional connectionless blast, put the signal out, never look back. The RTP will help us in that the RTP gives us a little bit of real time data, but really all it gives us is the ability to count packets, know where packets are, know what packet timing is, and know if we drop packets. Other than that, it's not doing a lot for us. It doesn't eat a lot of header room. Uh, it's one thing the video industry did do for the uncompressed side that the compressed in industry never did do RTP. So they never adopted it for whatever reason. But uh, we have within the video industry. So there's two basic standards out there that uh, we're going to deal with tonight. 2022 and 2110. So 2022 just takes raw SDI, encapsulates it in IP packets, and sends it exactly as it is. All the Hank, all the Vank, all the ANTS data, everything that's in it gets sent. 2110 only sends the quote essence. It is raster based and audio and data based. Each one of those, and we'll look at it, will be on its own flow. So we aren't going to send all this extra data, which means we have to be able to take things that are SDI, be able to tear them apart, put them into packets, send them across the network, and reassemble them on the other end, and get them back in time. And that's where 2022 still makes sense. If you're hauling video distances from one place to another over great distances, 2022 in my book is still the way to go. You put the video together, nothing's going to go multiple paths, nothing's going to move on you. You get it to the other end, break it back apart in the 2110. Now we have the ability to deal with things. Yes? Yeah, the other thing about 2022 is you were mentioning the compressed domain.
maybe maybe they were lucky. I don't know. <laughs> Didn't have to listen to me. <laughs> okay. So the piece we're going to look at tonight is part six and part seven, uh, which primarily deal with SDI and the encapsulation of SDI. So part six deals with the transport of what they call high bit rate media signals over an IP network. Uh, the base standard talks about 3G. I don't think that they've incorporated, I don't know, uh, I haven't been sticking on this one lately if they've been I don't think they've incorporated uh, 6 gig and 12 gig into that yet I'm sure they will probably at some point uh, but who knows that starts getting into other other issues the seamless protection switching then is the part seven so the highlights of this it deals with down to 270 1.485 and 3 gig like I said, it just encapsulates. You just take the data, throw it in IP packets, and ship it on its way. Um, it is, you know, frame centric. It starts at the beginning. A, a datagram starts at the beginning of a frame. The bits marked to mark the last uh, uh, last piece of a frame, and you null out the rest of the packets, and you start a new datagram on the restart of a frame again. It does support FEC, so you can add FEC to Dash 6. And I'll talk briefly about FEC. I have not seen to date anybody use it. Uh, the nice thing about it, as far as I know, they're doing it the same way they did in the compressed world. That typically, the FEC channel is going to be uh, up by 2 on the uh, Hello, brain just went dead. <laughs> uh, so, on the uh, hello, somebody help me out here. <laughs> so you're saying the port error correction, error correction. is uh, up by two on the, uh, on the port number. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I was told you. The brain just went out. Yeah. So you generally have your main flow, then two ports later will be the FEC flow. The nice thing about it, you can grab the main flow and just totally forget the FEC flow and you've got base 2022-6. So you can completely ignore it if you want. So the nice thing about it, devices that know how to deal with it can. Devices that don't, just don't look at that FEC flow. But the FEC does take up the extra room. So you are gonna have to support that. So the FEC can give you uh, on HD about six milliseconds of protection for data hits because it's the same FEC all the way through. The FEC changes with the data rate inversely uh, for the amount of data it can actually correct for. So we are going to turn around and just have our source IP address, our destination IP address, the RTP header, and just dump the SDI data into the rest of the remaining packet. So unlike the compressed world where we actually put individual MPEG packets, and we typically put seven MPEG packets in an IP packet, this is just raw SDI data going through. The dash seven piece of this works by taking a single stream and in 2022 dash six, you can just do this where you actually take the same exact stream, duplicate that same exact stream, IP address and all. And if you take a data hit and you happen to drop those two packets, it'll turn around and just grab those same two packets out of the opposite stream on the output and it just keeps on flowing and it works like a top. When we get to 2110, they've changed the rules a little bit. They still use this base standard, but they mandate that the streams be different IP addresses in 2110. In 2022-6, most people that are doing it or testing it this way are just literally duplicating the primary stream 
and just sending the same exact stream. And they're not even doing V3 on it to where you have source specific multicast. It's the exact same stream going down both pipes. But the nice thing about it is it's transparent to you or I and automatically. It's just going to add a fractional about bit of delay because you're going to have to store those packets in order to be able to tell you lost it and be able to go grab those existing packets and go through it. So my really, really quick piece on FEC, I came up with a, a really quick way to uh, talk and show people how FEC worked when I was trying to explain how FEC did what FEC can do. And believe it or not, there's a, a fairly simple way just to give you a conceptual view of it. But we're going to send data that will allow us to reconstruct data that gets lost. And there's different amounts of data that you can add for different amounts of protection. And the easiest way to look at it is, believe it or not, using a Sudoku. Think about it. If we drop that data block right there, and I happen to send you the FEC data in either row or column, look at it. What piece is missing? What's missing? Two. And conceptually, that's not how it works, but conceptually, that's exactly what FEC does, is it sends the data that will allow us to reconstruct a given piece. Now, in doing all of this, they generally dither the data, they generally do a lot to it so that when we take a hit that blows out one piece, those, that one piece is no longer uh, the same exact packets in a row. So we actually scramble the packets so that when we take a data block and take a hit, it spreads out. So it takes a hit right here, but the actual packets that it screwed up were here, here, and here. And that way they're individually correctable for that one big data hit. So there's a lot of weird things that go on in the background of that. But that's a very easy conceptual view of how FEC works. So it's actually a little more complex, but we just take the datagrams, we XOR them together, come up with an FEC that allows us to do the math backwards to figure out what piece actually is missing. You can send just row data only, or you can send uh, row and column. And if we look back here, if I was to take two hits going across here, my row data won't help me anymore, will it? But adding the column data, I could have another hit in here and still have the data to be able to recorrect that. So that's where adding that extra layer helps things by doing row and column. And that's what it's there for, to help us along. This is out of the Dash 7 standard telling you how much protection you're trying to put on and how much it's going to give you. I did a really quick calculation on it. And so at three gig, 12.5% is about 375 megabits for maximum protection is what it's gonna cost you to be able to do this. Yes, sir. How big are these data blocks? I honestly do not know. I'd have to go back to this. That's why God made PDFs. So I don't have to remember this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do well, not. The same size as the transmission blocks. Yeah. In the case of 2022. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good old VSF. Um, a lot of what we are doing is coming from SMPTE plus other organizations that are getting together and coming up with ways of doing things. The VSF came with TR04. TR04 was what SMPTE used part of and melded that and came up with the 2022-6 standard. So the video services form came up with wanting to be able to encapsulate this and be able to use the audio and the video and be able to use all this stuff. 
Uh, TRO3 was the essence based when they came up with being able to take raw individual essence and put them together and put them out as separate independent flows. But TRO3 started out as within transport stream. So it did meld and move into other things uh, where we are just raw data. So what has kind of happened here is TRO3, TRO4 have kind of morphed into what we are now using as uh, ST2110, our essence-based IP flow. Aspen is a kind of knockoff, doesn't do sort of parts one and two, but with SDI data, uh, it doesn't follow all the rules, all the standards. Uh, it doesn't behave well sometimes on certain things, uh, but the, that was what Everts first came out with because they already had the multiplex structure to be able to do transport streams. So all they ended up doing is putting video data in there uncompressed. So they had the whole infrastructure and the whole multiplexers to be able to do it. They still used uh, uh, MPEG timing. So we got PCRs. So it's not PTP based, it's PCR based. And it's a few other little things. And it does not do IGMP. So, and if you look at the 21 standard, it says thou shall do IGMP. No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know enough about it personally. So. Yeah. I mean, NDI is, 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 a is very much is a compressed standard, yeah. so it's, it, it's designed to make production easy within a, like a one gigabit, one gig solution. Okay. But what I would like to add about like TRO4, is that the, problem with TR, the, problem with, the problem with 2022 is that if you wanted to take out the audio and do something with it, mm -hmm. you, had de you had to depacketize it, de-embed it. Yeah. There was a lot of latency being brought back into the systems doing that. I believe TRO4, you've got not just SDI, but AES67 as a separate stream. So you can yeah. grab the audio and yeah. play with it still. But SD2110 allows the removal of all that excess stuff we don't need anymore anyway. So yes. It has a reduced bandwidth. So yeah, and I'm going to talk about all that. But thank you. So SD2110. <laughs> Why did we do it? That was a beautiful explanation. So you think about anything, especially things like newscasts, sports. We're doing voiceovers over some other video all the time. We have to turn around and deconstruct the video, de-embed the audio out of SDI so that we can turn around and have someone doing the, the announcing over the football game while they're going through 20-some-odd cameras in different angles but keeping the same audio going on while they're switching the cameras around underneath of them. So to make things easy in the production world is where 2110 came about. So that we could not have to e-embed, re-embed, de-embed, re-embed, and have all that delay and then turn around and have to figure out the timing to put all that back together. So we turn around and use something we're going to talk at the end here called PTP to turn around and timestamp the packets so we know exactly where they came from in time and exactly what packets they belong back with. So when we marry it back with video, they have the same stamp. So at least from a transmission standpoint and deconstructing it and reconstructing it, we don't get lip flap out of this. Now, still doesn't say anything about encoders and decoders, <laughs> which will exist forever, given us issues. But at least from this standpoint, so, like we said, it separates the elementary streams into individual essence streams. It's going to be raw AC, AES audio, AES, AES 67 audio. It's going to be raw raster data. It's going to be just the ANTS data. And send those on individual flows so that you can pass them through, deal with what you need to deal with, let the receiver put them back together and pull them back in time. 
So again, there is a whole set of different standards for all this stuff. So 2110-10 talks about the whole architecture of the whole system as a whole. 2110-20 talks about how we do the video. Then they came up with uh, dash 21, which now starts talking about the distribution timing and how do we treat within the network itself to do 10 gig to 10 gig type timing, what switches are doing, network compatibility. How do we do compatibility when we take the signal and we need to get it at 10 gig and then but drop it down to a one and a half gig play out. Do we have the data at the right time? Are we overflowing or are we underflowing buffers? So it's buffer modeling for 10 gig to 10 gig and 10 gig to decode in 2110. The dash 30 is for AES 67 audio. But the problem with AES 67 audio is it doesn't support when we want to send data over that, i.e any type of compressed information. It also throws away a whole lot of the metadata. Yes. Yes. So that's why 31 got developed and it isn't in progress, it's published. Yes. And, and so, okay. <laughs> um, so with that, we're gonna put all of the timing pieces back in and have the ability to send either AC3 audio through it, which is just sent as data, or turn around Dolby E, we can send as audio, as data through it, which AES67 doesn't support. And we get all of the status bits back, being able to do that, that we threw away in the raw AES67. Then dash 40 is the ancillary data. Basically, just taking the data that's in the ANTS and packetizing it. We're still keeping the DID, SDID. And I believe they're also keeping the line numbers of what it came off of so that we can put it back out on the proper line on the other end. Something we don't do in the MPEG world, unfortunately. Because when things get coded in MPEG, the MPEG encoder takes the data, puts it in either an SEI message or it throws it into an ANTS packet, the decoder puts it out where someone hand codes it to put back out. So it may not come back out on the same line it went in on because we don't take that data in the compressed world across. So they got a little smarter here so we know we can put it back out on line nine if your captions are coming in on line nine, we can put them back where you got them. Uh, we are using dash seven still as a seamless protection switching, but now you're gonna have to build it three times so that you're doing it for the audio flow, the, the video flow, and the ants flow going through. And like I said, in this part of the world, they did uh, state in the standard that each one of the flows has to have a different IP address. It can't be duplicated from an IP address standpoint. They want to be able to ID them and tell who's the primary, who's the secondary, all the way down. So we are going to take the raw data Again, just like we did with the SDI, except we, we are going to strip it back and grab just the raw video essence for the Dash 20, the Dash 30, or the Dash 40. The other unique thing about Dash 20 is it supports a whole bunch of things that SDI does not. SDI does not support 420. SDI does not support, at least at this point in time, 16-bit. Uh, we've got ACES color space. We've got all kinds of things in here that is not supported on the SDI side. It's great for production. It's great for post. But right now, I haven't got a post customer using any of this right now because they love the fact that they can put an SDI cable here and an SDI cable here when they're working on a very tight asset and they won't even run it through a router. It's plugged here, it's plugged here, and no one else can touch it. <laughs> so uh, had a couple folks uh, up 
the food chain in a couple places tell me they've never had their SDI hacked. So, <laughs> so uh, things are going on uh, here in this stuff. So we are going to take from a dash 20 perspective, take what we had here with our Hank and our Vank and do away with them. We're going to grab that data, process it elsewhere. Where does audio exist in the SDI world? In the horizontal interval, right? So we're going to have to grab that data out of the horizontal interval, get it into AS67 packets, and send it. We're going to have to take all the data that's up in the vertical blanking and grab that, put it in IP packets, and timestamp them. So, <coughs> dash 21, as I said, describes what we do for trans emitter performance for streams, uh, dealing with uh, packet pacing, bursts, gaps. Uh, one of the things that I personally hated to see come into all this was uh, software uh, senders because it destroyed half of what the data we had to tell if a network was sick or not. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit. So there are two different types of transmission, what they call narrow and wide, and two different types of senders. Narrow senders are typically either ASIC or DSP based, where they're going to put packets out absolutely perfectly spaced. They're going to turn around, get all the video data, fill a packet, ship the packet. Get all the video data, fill the packet, ship the packet. And at least on the outset of the transmitter, they are absolutely just perfectly spaced. Software has a problem with that because it's doing 40 gazillion other things and the CPU is being pulled to do many different tasks. So the packets end up coming out, a little bit of a gap coming out, a little bit of a gap, and they have a fairly big accordion effect to them. The first software senders drove most of the receivers that were first built nuts because they couldn't handle the scrunch of data all at one time or the wider gaps that were happening between packets. So everybody had to rethink their buffer modeling and typically wide systems are gonna have a, light, a much longer delay time because you've gotta increase your buffer modeling to be able to take data that's spread out or data that's coming really close together. So it does change things. Then we've got two different timing models, gapped and linear. Gapped means we are going to send the data basically as it was constructed. You hit the end of the raster, you don't send blanking, so you don't send packets until you hit the top of the raster again. So you end up with a gap from the very last packet to when you send the next packet at the very beginning at the top of the raster. So you send data for a whole raster, you stop, wait till you get back up time-wise up to the top of that raster, and you start sending data again. Uh, linear says, okay, let's take that, take that data and spread it out over the entire time so that we don't have that gap where we're not sending data anymore and it's going to fractionally slow the data down, but it's going to fill the whole time with an even flow or moderately close to even flow of data going across things. So this is my quickie easy picture here. So with wide gapped, you're going to get packets that have different spacings between. You're going to get ga little bits of gaps between packets. You're going to have packets clumped together, a little bit of gap. And then typically you're going to have the horizontal interval with no data sitting in it. With narrow gap, you are going to have data out in order and then no data. And then you get the first packet at the beginning of the top of the raster again. In narrow linear, you spread the data out 
so that you are continually sending data even through the entire horizontal blanking interval. It's more of a smooth output, but you have to slow the data down. You have to kind of buffer that to be able to do that. I have not seen a linear gapped yet. I don't know, has anybody seen linear gapped? Every time I've seen, or excuse me, wide. I have the, the wide gapped, I have not seen wide linear. I haven't seen anybody do that yet. I'm, I don't even know if it's part of the standard to be able to do it. I don't know why it wouldn't be, but I have not seen it. So all the stuff that I've seen that has been software generated has all been gapped. So the buffer modeling that has been created looks at a sender's ability to put out the data and the switch's ability to deal with cleaning up data and how much does it take to make a clean flow on the other end. So I've got data with small gaps, maybe slightly larger gaps going into a switch and the switch's ability to be able to put that out nice and clean on the other end and how much does that take to be able to do that. The standard is it's supposed to be able to do it within four packets. So typically you should be riding around two packets and just bouncing up and down a little bit to be able to put this data back out so that you don't get too wide a spread on your network and your receivers at least have data all the time to deal with. The VRX buffer deals with the 10 gig data coming in, but I'm only going to have a gig and a half coming out at the decode end. So I'm going to have a buffer here that's filling up every time it gets a 10 gig packet, but it's going to run down as it fills out the one and a half gig. You don't want to turn around and ever have the buffer underrun. You don't want to have the buffer overrun. So how am I doing managing getting the data to a decode buffer within that time frame? And we do have the ability uh, within the prism to turn around and graph those out and tell you what your min, what your max is on both of the Cmax and on the VRX buffer, turn around and tell you how well your buffer modeling is staying within what the standard says you're supposed to, so that you know that it should be able to go to anybody's receiver and everybody should be able to take the max. <clears throat> As I said before, uh, 2110 uses the dash seven spec, just as 2022-6, but they have stipulated that uh, the IP streams be on separate IP addresses to where most of the time, the stuff I've seen so far is nice thing about it. You, so you can go into a switch with one input, you can come out with two joins and you can get a dash six stream coming out from the sender and just send that with dash uh, 2022 dash seven on a dash 10 system, you actually have to create two flows and you're gonna have to change the addresses on the second flow. So it's gonna be a little bit more work to doing that. Now, dash 30, AES 67 format for PCM audio. Uh, it does support 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, 24 bit linear. Uh, there are different levels. There's level A, level B, level C. Level A supports one millisecond packet spacing. So one of the things they did in the audio is they set, we are going to put the data out at absolute intervals. And within that, 48 kilohertz piece, level A, you can get up to eight channels. Now I'd say about half the vendors I've seen are doing a max of four channels. I know a vendor that does one channel. So if you want a 5.1, you're gonna have six independent audio flows to get there. Uh, if you want to 
turn around and do something closer to SDI, we're going to have to work on things here. Uh, level B just changes the packet spacing. Now, which means there's not going to be as much data in each packet. The data rate actually goes up because you're sending a lot of nulls with that because you aren't completely filling the packets with audio data in order to be able to send them at that higher rate. You have to go up to level C to be able to get up to 16 channels to be able to duplicate what we're doing in SDI to get 16 channels. We at least have to go to level C. So if you're going to do the bottom end, which is what's mandatory, that means if I'm going to send 16 channels, I'm going to have to put in two independent audio flows on two separate IP streams. And someone's going to have to be able to get that data, pull it apart, put it back together, know where things are, and if things cross boundaries, be able to put them together, take them apart. A few fun things here in this. Um, we are currently supporting up to 16 channels in level C uh, with the prism right now. So we can do single channels all the way up to uh, 16 channels at the moment. So uh, to duplicate SDI, like I said, uh, to carry 16 embedded channels, we must use two streams to be compliant with level A, or we can use one level C stream at a much higher packet interval. Dash 40. So we did keep the DID and the SDID are still present. We have thrown a lot of ANTS data away that was kind of superfluous data that isn't relevant for today's world or isn't really relevant to send down an SDI pipe. Um, I know one of the ones was packet deletion that you could find when someone did something that still send the packet, but they say this packet's ready to be deleted. Why even send it? <laughs> so we're not allowed to use, I forget, I think it's, uh, Oh, the DID is 60, and I forget what the SDID is for it, but, uh, but it was packet deletion. And it actually could screw things up, because I've seen many times where people modified captions, and they'd turn around and modify the captions, put the captions on the deleted, the old captions on the deleted packet, put the new captions in, and I have seen multiple receivers barf on it, because... They weren't actually paying attention to the DID, SDID. They were looking for the header of the caption packet. And I actually saw one studio monitor decoding captions absolutely perfect. And there was absolutely no captions technically in the file. <laughs> 6101 did not exist but yet the monitor was putting out captions because it wasn't looking at the DID, SDID. It was looking at the 9669, which is the header sync of the caption packet <laughs> because they were making files and they were sending their files off to whoever they were making them for and every single one of them was getting rejected and kicked back to them saying there's no captions in it, but yet there's $30,000 studio monitor said, yes, there's captions in here. <laughs> And I get in and look at it with some of our equipment. I go, no, there's not. They go, yes, there is. And they point it to the monitor and says, well, I don't know how you're getting that, but it's not the same signal as here. And the guy holds up the piece of coax between the two. And he goes, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I dug deeper and I found the caption data in there, but sure wasn't on 6101 as far as the DID, SDID. So, so weird things can happen in the world. So that's my really quick run through of kind of the overview of where we are in compressed video, or excuse me, uncompressed video over IP. Um, we do have the ability to look at it, see it. I'll bring some of this stuff up. I actually have both 2022-6, 2110 running here, and actually GPS locked PTP running right now. 
because I got a little GPS antenna sitting over in the corner over here. And it's picking up, believe it or not, it's picking up 11 birds <laughs> out of 15 <laughs> sitting in the window. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, I know in my office at home, I'm on the second floor, but I've got a tile roof. I can put it on my desk in the middle of the room and I can get nine birds. <laughs> Which I thought astounded me <laughs> that I still could get that. So PTP, PTP is the new black burst for this IP world. PTP has been around for quite some time. The entire uh, financial industry is based on PTP because when someone makes a trade and they say trade now, they want it recorded now <laughs> and PTP helps with that timestamp and that time marker. Cell phone industry, cell handoff from one cell to another cell to another cell as you're driving is all PTP based as we hand off from point to point to point. PTP is time based. It is raw time. It is not a pulse at a start of video or at the big end of a field or frame. It is raw time, starting from some epoch or some point in time. The problem with the IEEE piece of PTP is it had absolutely no idea about video frames, video references, or some of the fun stuff that we do on uh, this continent at least where video is not an even multiple of something. It's a 1.001 offset of everything. So it didn't know jam sync. It didn't know anything about time. And how do we count out something that doesn't quite count out? And I got to add something to it to make it count out every 10 seconds or whatever and make things work. Uh, didn't know anything about drop frames all this fun stuff. So we have added a SMPTE piece to this that is ST2059 that goes on top of the IEEE standard to add all of the stuff that we need to make video work <laughs> and to be able to carry things out in our non-integer based timing. <laughs> so we are used to being able to take some sync pulse generators, run them into an emergency changeover, and distribute that timing out to multiple pieces of equipment. We're used to being able to take things and we want them all at the same point when they enter or exit a router and be able to do advanced or delayed sync so that we can move sync around so we can get things in time. We cannot do that with PTP because it is time and you can't change time. It is what it is. So you can't advance it. You can't delay it. It's coming raw right off GPS. So the receivers have to deal with it. The signal itself is going to be raw time based. Everybody's going to get the same time. But if you need something delayed or you need something advanced, you're going to have to deal with it in the receiver itself. It isn't going to happen on the signal being fed to you anymore. So it's a whole new concept of dealing with things here. Also, we don't really have a changeover. We have a algorithm that's called a BCMA, Best Grandmaster Clock Algorithm. And it is a decision that the two clocks, or three, or four, or five, or six, however many you want to have, make amongst themselves. So the receivers just receive a stream. It is a specific multicast. It is always the same multicast. It is always the same ports on the same multicast. So 
that the, receive, the uh, sync pulse generators have to talk to each other to decide who is going to be the grand poobah in all of this. And there's a voting that takes place. And it's based on a whole list of parameters that I'll go over that set this stuff up. And you need to be really careful in how you set things up. So the IEEE 1588 is the base for the standard. Then we had 2059-1 and 2059-2 where we added some things to it. And those are the biggest pieces of what we're going to look at here and spending a little bit of time on PTP because it is the thing that is going to drive you absolute batty. Getting everything to sync and work together correctly. In your discussion, are you going to talk about a hybrid facility at all where you have Blackbird and PTP operating? I can do that because I have that running right here. Perfect. <laughs> so, there's several different things that come about within PTP. Profile identification. So profile is nothing more than just a number so that you could actually have multiple PTPs going out over the same IP switch matrix. And you could have an AES67 set going and then you could have a video going but you could have something else going to somebody else and you can divide those out by their well that's actually the domain excuse me that's the domain you can divide those out by the domain so the profile identification uh, we'll get into so the best master clock algorithm is how all of this is done everybody does the same thing has the same voting and we're going to look at several parameters in what's going through here. Uh, we deal with path delay. So there is packets that are sent out. There's packets that are sent back. So that I know it took this long to get here. And it took this long to get back. So that I timestamp when I got it. I send you my timestamp. You send it back to me again. I grab the timestamp. Send it back to you again. And now you turn around and you send that thing how much to delay itself or how much to advance itself so that it knows what that path delay actually was. The one thing that PTP relies on is a network that has the same delay in both directions because we only measure it in one. We don't measure the path going back. We assume that path is symmetrical, which changes switch architecture a whole bunch because <laughs> you can't have routing decisions made purely on bandwidth loading in a single direction. <laughs> if you change routing directions in one direction, you got to change it the same for the opposite direction. So some of this crisscross stuff that a lot of the uh, guys doing uh, network raw just data networks are used to being able to do that they could send a path through this they could get it back through this we can't do that in video it will not survive well it's got to go this way and come back that way so we're going to look at some of this stuff ptp for video was designed to be synchronized within five seconds. That's something we're going to have to get used to. We're used to being able to throw black on something and it goes boom and it's locked. <laughs> this stuff goes well, let me pack it. Well, how much delay do I have? Here's my delay, here's my packet, here's my delay, and I'll walk myself in. Normal PTP networks, like cell phone networks, a lot of those take like eight minutes to sync. So the people dealing with PTP from 1588 perspective have no idea of what the video requirements are. Um, yes, sir. PTP, but one of the key things about PTP is that it's always running. So it may take me eight minutes to set up my clock, but yes. then I have my clock. 
Yes. And unless I have a really inferior clock, that clock is going to stay relatively close. Yes. And so when but I we're used to being able to turn the network on no, 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 and apply know, something. When I make a request for a time, I get a time back. Yes. Uh, it may not be 100 percent point zero 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 accurate. It may be off by a little bit because the, the clocks aren't quite synchronized. Yeah. But it's there. It's not like uh, I press press start. Yeah. And I have to wait five seconds before I get an idea of time. No. No, it's not. But I'm, I'm saying on the application of PTP to a network, it doesn't sync quickly. It takes time before that network syncs. It's implementation dependent. Yes. Highly. Oh, dependent. yeah. Dependent. And I, I'd say, so man, yeah, now I'd say. Who you buy equipment yeah. from has gotten even, even, even more important yeah. than it ever because was before. Because the, the one thing that we are having to do on the back side of this, we're still synchronizing oscillators. And you still have a phase lock loop you're pulling. And you can't jam most phase lock loops instantly from this piece of time to this piece of time. You got to yank them to where you need them. So you're doing a, a, a pull on that phase lock loop. And that's one of the reasons, at least on the video side, because we still have to take GPS. We have to create all of these oscillators and all these time bases that video physically runs on. So they're still in every single receiver multiple phase lock loops now that we have to run and time. So, and they just don't go. And it takes a while to get the timing because we have to work the delay of the path out. And that takes several packets back and forth to work the path delay out so that I can account for what the path delay is. Um, we are supposed to be able to maintain within one microsecond accuracy between two slave devices to a master and the synchronization is metadata. So we have a PTP domain. And so what a PTP domain is, this is the piece I started off on, is the ability to separate multiple PTP networks that might be on the same exact pipe. So that I want to lock to the video PTP for this. I'm going to lock to the AES67 PTP for that. I may put on a second video network for somebody else, someplace else that isn't associated with this. So we can assign different domains to those. This is where you've got to be really, really careful because there is a default, a, excuse me, a default value of 127 that most people build their generators. And then all of a sudden, someone slaps a generator on there. And if you're still sitting on the default of 127, a second generator comes up and he's 127. Now you got two PTP generators spewing out fractionally different data. And PTP just goes, boom! It doesn't handle it. Um, so I'll talk about that. The grandmaster, the master. So there will be a single grandmaster. There can be any number of master clocks. You can have as many master clocks as you want. Basically, all they're doing is waiting for something to happen to the grandmaster. And then there is some priorities that you set up on who is next in line, who is next in line, who is next in line, and how this stuff goes. So in a typical installation, how many grandmasters and master clocks are Grandmaster? And you have one grandmaster, you may have another master in a video installation. Yeah. If you're a bank, it may be very, hmm. very different. Yeah. But we're not banks. So, yeah, so they, what I've seen to date so far, the, the, everybody has built them pretty much like we've built conventional, where you had a master and a, and a you know, primary generator, second generator going into an ECO and it's changing over. They're putting in the one that they're going to set up as the grandmaster. The second one is the master in waiting. And pretty much it stopped there. But the standard allows virtually for 127 of them to be sitting out there. Actually, you could go more if you get crazy. But so that's going to be the, the master clocks waiting. Slave clocks, thousands. Now, you're going to have to really work on something because 
PTP is moderately verbose and you can OD a grandmaster, most grandmasters may or may not take up to a thousand individual slaves talking to them. If you get over a thousand slaves, I don't know of a grandmaster that can handle that traffic. So the chatter going back and forth gets way too hard. So we've got some things to help us with that, that uh, we'll, we will talk about. So anything that's on the end of the device, so slave clock, you'll also see it called an ordinary clock. So slave clock, ordinary clock are synonymous with each other. It just depends on who wrote it. <laughs> I like slaves because that's what they're doing. They're slaving to the grandmaster and what's going on. But that's kind of where we go. So each domain is going to have a grandmaster and the domain can be a number from 0 to 127. The default value is 127. One of the first things you want to do when you build a network is change that to an incredibly low number. Some don't put zero because zero is for AES, but something down low because I can't tell you how many times we have found someone comes up and someone throws in a device that has the ability to be a clock and it's 127 and you left it at 127 then all of a sudden you've got two guys on here with the same domain and they're both trying to play master. You need to be in control of who is the master of this whole stuff. So there are some things to help us along. Uh, in the beginning of this whole thing Transparent clocks looked like they were going to have a really big uh, place in all of this. And they've kind of fizzled and gone by the wayside because this little thing down here on the bottom, boundary clocks, have gotten incredibly cheap and incredibly prolific. And I'll talk about the differences between these two. So a transparent clock, all it does is takes the time that the packet took to get through it inserts that value into a field in the header of the PTP telling the next piece down the line, hey, it took X number of microseconds to get through me so that it knows to subtract that off because it got delayed by that switch by this much. Boundary clocks, you can almost think of them as reclocking DAs in the analog style world. It is going to talk northbound to the Grandmaster and it's going to start a completely brand new clock session between it and the slaves on every single port is going to be a new boundary clock. So the communication is just between that port and however many slaves it's dealing with, between that port and how many slaves it's dealing with, but its lock is still locked to the Grandmaster still passes the Grandmaster's messages so the other end, when you hit the slaves, know who you're locked to ultimately, but it stops the chatter from going all the way back up the pipe. So now you can get, theoretically, a thousand slaves on every single port and a thousand boundary clocks talking back to a single generator, theoretically. I don't think I'd ever want to go that high, <laughs> but that's, and I said, and the thousand is the top end of the system. I've seen systems crap out in the hundreds <laughs> from not being able to keep up with chatter on this stuff. So a boundary clock, so you've got the grandmaster up here and it is syncing the boundary clock and it is starting a new clock session here and a new clock session here but the time of these two clock sessions is all based on the data that it is getting from the absolute grandmaster but it the chatter from this slave doesn't have to go all the way up to here it's just going to be here the chatter for this guy is here 
and then this guy is going up here. It will pass video through the whole path, but it's going to start a new clock session. But that lock of that clock session is based on that grandmaster. <coughs> a transparent clock is going to get the PTP messages, and all it's going to do is put a value of the time that it calculated that this packet sat inside of that switch, transversing the innards of that switch. So that's why they call it transparent, because time-wise it's transparent to the network. So does the boundary clock typically live in the router? Yes, sir. Okay. Some routers. Mostly switches. <coughs> so, if we had this situation here to where we had a grandmaster up here going down to a transparent clock, that transparent clock is sending out its sync with the correction factor to its slave. It's going to send out the sync to the correction. <coughs> to possibly a boundary clock. Now the boundary clock will be a slave to him, but a master to everybody down below him. And it's an independent master on every single port. Oh, I have one here, thank you though. I appreciate that. <coughs> different manufacturers make um, clocks, PTP clocks, right? Yes. If they are made to the standard, yes. But you better test the bejeevas out of it. <laughs> what about on the switch side? Is it found the implementation changes between the vendors? Yeah. Um, what I've found so far, and don't have all the reasons for it, is most boundary clocks don't like losing their sync. They do have internal oscillators, but when they lose their sync on the northbound side, they freak and then start over. Then they have to reconvert back to the grandmaster. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. And, and, uh, there are a good half dozen parts to 2059 that are yet to be written and published to try to instruct manufacturers what to do and how not to be total idiots. <laughs> I don't Everybody doubt that at all. Either their version of stuff the way they think it needs to work, hmm. or test gear for it, or whatever. Yes. Yeah. So here's a uh, quick view of something here. So we are taking PTP out of the Grandmaster here, going into a transparent clock, sending that out to possibly a switcher, out to slaves that happen to be, in this case, cameras, out to possibly another uh, generator out here that's going to slave to PTP because now you might need a whole slew of black signals in a completely different location. So you have the, agen the ability to take, slave yourself to PTP on one side and generate brand new black and you don't have to carry necessarily that black from up there through some place where you're probably going out with fiber and it would take you probably fiber to get the black there. And then we're going to turn around and send a little bit of control over that same fiber. We're going to send a little bit of audio and video over that same fiber and have a lot of things going on. And we might run another PTP master that may not even be co-located with that guy. As long as these two guys can talk to each other, it works absolutely fine. There is no such thing in the video world as a 100% air-gapped A network and B network or red and blue or whatever you want to call them. PTP has to talk across those networks. Otherwise, 
the generators will never know who is the master. So the generators have to talk to each other. The clocks. It's not the receivers. So weird things happen when things don't behave because you may build a network and you may make a PTP path so that this generator can talk to this generator. But by the time you converge those two networks into one receiver, there may be a path within that receiver that this network can get back out this network and you can start getting loops. And then things get really ugly and they get really fun to find those loops because that port should actually go dormant as far as PTP is concerned if it's already getting PTP down another direction. I see that cloud there in the lower corner. Yes. And, and, and this is all within a LAN at this point, correct? Yes. Is anyone doing PTP across, across a WAN? It's not suggested. It's strongly not suggested. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yes. By there's. Not Hmm. Yes. Guys. Yeah. Don't do that. It's stupid. Yes. Because it's GPS based. All you do is start a new generator. You're going to have the same exact PTP time here. That's an interesting point. Now the flexibility of 2110 kind of falls apart. Why don't you slap a WAN on there then? No. no, no not at all. You rely on GPS. You have to tunnel. Yeah. And so there's. <laughs> where somebody can walk in the door with a laptop and hook it up to my network and crash the whole thing, unless you architect it correctly. Yes. And there's a whole industry out there that deals with this that does not advertise their services. You have to go find them through recommendations, and some of them actually put you through a vetting process that makes a loan officer look like a walk in the park. Before they will talk to you about your technical needs. Yes. This and is a really, really important and unfortunately under attack aspect of the brave new IT world. Yeah. And, and some of the other reasons for that is if you're going to go through things, it's not going to be just one active component you're going to go through to get three quarters of the way across the country or all the way across the country. There's a lot of movement in that. Why not reestablish a brand new, perfectly stable time base? You look at the PTP stamps that are in the video. You have the same exact PTP that this guy had when he created it, except it's stable. It's all based on the same GPS. And now you just can buffer the input to get rid of that movement, and your PTP isn't moving. Yes, sir. The, uh, the good news out of all of this, of course, it's obvious that none of us are basketball fans. <laughs> but for people that are basketball fans, that entire tournament is running on PTP and 2110. Yes. 100% of the signals from all the games and all the stadiums are coming in to New York that for Atlanta that route. So the. They put a lot of yeah. More than into the production. Yeah. The the other thing that is wise is that this may all be 2110. In a lot of cases, this should not be 2110. This should be 2022-6. Put it back together so that a packet has everything in it. I'm, 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 that's myself. I'm a firm believer in that. In that you don't, because otherwise you're sending packets and they're different IP addresses and they don't have the ability to go and make screen go spike. <laughs> and, you know, go through things. That's the one place that staying with 2022 6 in my book makes sense. Yeah, back here where I'm doing the production, where I need 
separate audio, I need separate video for everything that I'm doing within the production realm that I don't have to embed, de-embed, and I have access to all those signals and be able to work with them. I don't need that getting it from point A to point B. So you're saying for the long haul? For the long haul. Transmission format. Yes, yes. Sure, yes, and then you pull it back out when you're going to work on it at the next facility, but they didn't go different paths and they didn't get lost. Is that what they're doing for the games? You mean referring to? I don't know because my CBS friends won't talk to me in that level of detail. <laughs> <laughs> I have the, the one that I saw recently. Yeah, um, the, the path that I saw down at uh, Television City, I watched, looked at the path, and it was a uh, 1080p SDI that was actually coming out of the IRD, off of the feed, off the fiber feed. And I think it was actually, the transmission for that, I think was actually JPEG 2000. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably JPEG. You may be using Sure. Yeah. Yes. 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 And the other thing that I can't emphasize strong enough is this is a video network and a video only network. Do not put internet on it. Do not put your phone traffic on it. Do not do data backups over it or your video will crash. It can't take that burstiness of all of that traffic. Well, let alone the fact you really don't want people hacking in. And True. Doing you you don't want those, those things melded to where they have access to each other. But the amount of movement that those create within the network because of their burstiness kills video. What? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. You're you're gonna you're you're gonna you're gonna pay to be able to do that. But well, yeah. There's a ton of glue products out there that are SDI on this side, some form of IP on this side, <laughs> so that we can feed this network we're trying to create with all these devices that you already own <laughs> that you don't want to replace because they work perfectly well so yeah we're we're going to be doing that for the next 20 20 years probably want to take and make the core okay be the majority of what you are yes because because every time you have a different signal it's another multicast in many cases it's Two multicasts minimum. So you know, if, if I got a twenty-one ten with video, audio, etc., and yeah. I want to also have it as a twenty twenty-two dash six, all of a sudden I have an, another set of bandwidth with the same information, just in a different format. Why yeah. do it? Yeah. Typically, it's because it's a different path. Yeah. If it's a different path, it's different. But again, if it's yeah. And in a lot of cases, so. For most slave devices on the outside edges, like cameras and others, they expect the sync to actually be on the same exact fiber that the video, the control, the audio, and everything else is. It makes perfect sense. For some devices, it does not make sense. Like a switcher. You've got variable signals coming and going of whatever they're joining. You've got to have PTP sitting in that thing all the time. It makes sense to have a PTP link going external. So I know people are trying to build PTP like we built black, and there's a lot of people trying that, and they're going to have nothing but headaches with it because the delays are going to be different through that network than they are going to be through the video network, and they're going to have all kinds of fun with it. But 
in some cases you may have to tunnel out PTP and feed certain devices that don't always have vid the same video coming into them, like a switcher, that needs to still be locked. So there are cases where having an independent PTP lock makes sense. But there's a lot of cases why I have the extra network and the extra cabling and everything else when you can easily carry it over the same piece of glass. Steve, there's actually some very sound security reasons for some of these multi-headed architectures, though. Um, one of the reasons that we may take the five-second mention out of 2059 Part 2 uh, upon request of the uh, interop group <laughs> to their senses and realize, oh, we probably need to say some things about security. Again, it's really out of our area. But part of what's going to slow down connecting the cable from making a picture is going to be vetting what's on that RJ45. Who are you? How do I know it's you? And I... ESPN in Bristol is probably, although I think uh, Turner in Atlanta is close on their heels, the best demos of what you can do with an arbitrary device being plugged in. Oh, yeah. And how you shut it down so fast that the hacker, because that, that one of the scenarios is an intruder, is blocked out. Yeah. But you've got a whole lot of backup hardware. That's IETF stuff that we don't speak. Yeah. That does all that. So you can do you and can do so MAC filtering, you can do IP source filtering, you do IP destination filtering. Protocol. So when you turn around and uh, I know all of the the cable stuff that I deal with on the compressed side, if I take my laptop as it is, put it on whatever uh, multicast address, I plug it into the switch. I can get a service for about two seconds, and the part goes dead. So you're saying the joint, uh, the, the joint groups are not spelling it out yet to the manufacturers? Well, no. The, the engineering guidelines that we realize we need to write ultimately don't have a huge amount of bandwidth support from the manufacturers who are the ones that are going to have to write the advice to help ensure things will interop. The good news is that the interop group is alive and well and well below the radar like they're supposed to be and have been doing very, very good and sound interop testing and come up with a number of things that need to get clarified in the, in the the two parts of 2059 that are published are technically still under one year review three years into the process. <laughs> so this is non-trivial. So moving on here. Um, so there are several messages that take place in PTP. The very first one is an announce message. The announce message comes from the Grand Master. He says, hey, I am the Grand Master and these are the rates that I'm going to send these rest of these messages because there are some suggested rates and people can massage those rates, send things faster or send things slower. Sync and follow up. So that's going to be a message sent from the master to tell a slave, this is my time. The slave's going to send that back to the master. The master's going to send another sync to him. The slave's going to take and say, this is my time. Send it back to him. Then the master's going to send a delay request to tell him how much he needs to turn around and delay because he's going to take those other two responses, divide them in half, add them together, divide them in half, and he's got an average of what the two delays were and 
turn around and tell them this is how much time it took for these messages to get to you. So we can set up several things here. The very first being what domain are you going to be dealing with? Everybody that you want to talk to with this master has to be on that domain. Then <clears throat> the profile is typically going to be the ST2059 profile. Then we've got several other things here and the first being priority one and priority two. Those are two values that you set. They are going to be what sets the voting rights. Typically, everybody is going to be the same priority one. Priority two now is going to set who's the master, who's the grandmaster, the lowest value wins. So that's where you're going to go in and typically make that number also a very low number so that it gets off of what most gear is when it gets plugged into the network. Five, four, two. <laughs> no, you stay away from zero and one. Why are they setting those priority numbers so high? Because they can. <laughs> it's called a committee. There were a number of sound technical reasons why we chose the numbers we chose. I don't remember all of them. Yeah. Now. So, one of the things that's going to be in that announce message is how often am I going to send these messages? What is my message rates? And one of the things you're going to see if you go back and look at the, uh, <clears throat> just the raw PTP, the standard versus video, our message rates are much faster because we're dealing with something that's happening faster. We're dealing with video frames and we need to be able to have more accurate data. But, so I'm gonna set priority one. So if I'm set to 128 and I have my second unit uh, is gonna be set to 128, but his priority two is gonna be set to 130 or something else. So I'm not gonna set, and like I said, the lowest number wins. So in my case, I generally go down to like 10, and I skip them by 10, 20, 30, 40, just to make things simple for my poor little brain. So where 10 is going to be the grandmaster, 20 is going to be the next guy in line, 30 might be the third one in line. And then what lives between those two happens to be clock class, clock accuracy, and clock variance. That gets into how good is your GPS signal. Because if your GPS signal falters, but the other guy's signal does not, those live above priority two. So they will override priority two, even though you are the master, if your GPS signal is better than the grandmaster's, you're gonna tell him to go shut up, I'm taking over, and you take over. So. What other uh, communication modes are there? Is that a default setting without negotiation? There are selections on that. I'll get into that in just a second. So <clears throat> what happens here is the grandmaster is going to send out a sync, tell them this is my time. The slave now knows what the time is. He's going to send his time back. And then he's going to send the same message again. So there is this little guy called the follow-up. And typically within the video realm, we don't use follow-up messages. Follow-up messages were created for software appliances that couldn't necessarily keep up with the exact amount or the exact time when I sent the sync message out. I didn't really have the proper P PTP time. So I'm going to send the sync message but I'm gonna send a follow-up and say, oh, by the way, this is actually the correct time for that. It had extra time to go grab that data and calculate. In today's world, with anybody doing this stuff, I've not, at least in the video realm, not seen people using 
a two-step method. It's called two-step. You have one step and two-step. One step, you're just going to send a sync. He's going to respond. You're going to send a sync. He's going to respond. You're going to take that data, subtract the two, divide it by, and then you're going to get a delay response that's going to tell you how much that you need to delay to account for that network path. And now the receiver knows where to move. Uh, you would possibly think that that would be a uh, stable setting, but we'll look at it here. It moves around every single time you send those messages and you're sending them, uh, well, let me see sync. I'm sending them eight messages a second. Every one of them is gonna be a different delay every single time. So here is what the message delay actually looks like. So this is the messages going from the master to the slave. And you can see that there is an average that's going on here, but you can see some of the packets are taking a little longer to get there than others. We can actually look at the slave back to the master. They're a little more consistent. Why might that be? Hmm? How much data is on the return channel versus the channel coming at you? Ding, 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 ding. Nothing, very little. And that's typically why you get these differences. This is what all the video is and everything else that's coming down the network versus just messaging typically going backwards from, from, from a delay, from a switch processing standpoint, yes. Return messages are ideally the same length, and and we're seeing here that they're not necessarily. They well, no the half is the same. The switch delay is going to be fractionally different, okay. just because of the time it takes for switches to process. Because how many packets are getting in a row that went out that port? That's how many you're going to stack back, right? You have five of them get up and say, "Hey, I all need to get out this one port." Well, if they all jump up at the same time. They ain't going to get out at the same time, are they? It's going to get stacked back. And if all you have is a little bit of chatter going back the other way, you don't have as much that you're going to stack back on. On PTP, yes. On video, no. You turn QoS on a switch, there's so much data, it will instantly OD the CPU in that switch on one flow. So the message rates are slow enough. Typically, I have seen these message rates actually OD switches on QoS because they are multiple times a second type messaging. But typically, they, you do put QoS on those. So we have multicast, mixed mode, and unicast. Okay, multicast, the... Source is going to send it out. All receivers are going to receive it because they have all joined that same multicast because it's one address. Everybody who's a slave has joined that multicast. They are going to get up in no particular order and say, hey, here's my sync. Here's my sync. Here's my sync. And they got to get responses. And those responses are going to go to all the other receivers who have to ignore it now because it is multicast, and you're sending a multicast back that they have joined. <laughs> yeah. So you can see, uh, so for a thousand slaves, how many messages? <laughs> That's why things fall over. <laughs> now, mixed mode, and I'll show you diagrams of this, kind of show you the messaging going. Um, not many devices support it yet. It will probably at some point be the dominant in the industry, but it's going to take us a long time to get receivers to do this. So sync is always going to be a multicast going out, 
but now your delay requests and the delay responses will be a unicast between you two. So that when you send it up, it doesn't blast to everybody in the world. But that means you're going to get multicast, unicast, multicast, unicast. And everybody's got to be able to negotiate those. And I'd say the majority of the devices I've seen so far do not support that yet. Uh, unicast would be just a pain in the proverbial to set up. <laughs> because you have to establish a unicast path from every single receiver to that dude. And it's got to talk to each one independently. There may be forthcoming automated ways of actually managing large unicast networks that include some of the security stuff. Yeah. Not done yet. But. So let's look at this. So what happens is an announce message comes out. And it says, hey, I am the grandmaster here. It's going to go out to everybody. He's going to send out a sync. Sync's going to go out to all of the ordinary clocks, all the slaves. <clears throat> Follow-up of using two-step. Normally, we don't use that. But now, a receiver is going to say, hey, here's my delay request. It's also going to go out to all the other guys because it's multicast, and he's sending it back on the multicast address. They are going to turn around and ignore it. But it's a boatload of traffic. And then he's going to respond back to him. But it's also going to go to everybody else. But he's talking to that one unit. So the mixed mode, he still says, I am the master. That's going to flow to everybody. He's going to say, hey, I am the sink. But now he's going to turn around and say, hey, as a unicast, I am sending you my delay request. I am going to send you my delay response. And the rest of these guys are waiting for their turn. <clears throat> so here's just a Wireshark grab of this fun stuff. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to go over some diagrams that uh, kind of point this out. Just remember that clock class sits between priority one and priority two here. So there are several different clock classes and there's several different uh, accuracies. The best accuracy you're going to get is 100 nanoseconds. The best we can get off GPS is about 80 nanoseconds. There is one or two devices out there that says, hey, my accuracy is a 20. They are lying their pants off because you cannot get that off GPS. You can off of this little thing of cesium. <laughs> Yes. Their master. Yeah. It does have the ability to get down there. GPS does not. But these are customers and devices I have seen that are GPS locked. And they're coming back with a 20 is there. And that screws up the whole voting rights. Because that's part of who ends up being the Grand Master. So anybody that is locked to GPS will be a clock class 6. If you lose GPS and you go to your internal clock, you go to a class 7 until your phase gets, and I don't know the value, there's a point at when you hit your drift off of that, then you're going to go down to one of these other values. Now, in our stuff here, I, I need to get it in here and stuff it in here because this is out of the standards. Uh, we actually will tell you if you're black locked, if you're 10 megahertz locked, if you are running on internal. None of those are going to be as good as GPS locked. 
and there are different points along here, and we actually spell those out and tell you, okay, you're black burst locked or you're 10 megahertz locked, or you're running on your internal and haven't been there. So internal is 248. So let's take a peek here. If I have two generators going into a switch, this one priority one, 128, he's 128, his priority two is 120, his priority two is 126, and if they're both GPS locked to the same GPS and everything else is fine between that, who's my grandmaster? The guy on the right. His priority two is lower than his priority two. He takes a hit on his GPS. This guy's still got his GPS. So he's going to go from a clock class 6 to a clock class 7. He's still what clock class? 6. That lives above priority 2. So he is now going to take over. He's going to tell this unit, hey, my clock class is higher than your clock class. Shut up. I'm taking over. Nice thing about it. It's the same exact time. You may miss one or two spews of messages, but the messages are exactly at the same time. So everybody picks it up and just goes, okay. I'm not looking at you anymore. I'm looking at him. The grandmaster ID changes. Okay. He's the grandmaster. And he loses GPS. Who's the grandmaster now? No, this guy's still got GPS. Who's the grandmaster? Uh uh. Priority one is above the clock class. That's why you got to be really careful when you set these things up. You don't want to divide them out by priority ones. He has to go away. <laughs> Physically stop transmitting before this guy's going to take over. Because you got, what? how good is my clock? Lives below priority one, but above priority two. Yeah. Yeah, that dude changed. No. No, somebody set this up wrong, thinking that they're going to create a voting rights here, and I want to make sure this guy is going to be my grandmaster, so I'm putting priority one where I think I should put it, but you're actually screwing the pooch. So the voting rights are actually priority two. Yes, that's where that should be. So, so I, ideally, did, did I hear correctly that both priority one and priority two want to be low numbers, so you might have priority one set at five on both and uh, and four and three on the respective Sure. Pairs. Yeah. Okay. And the only reason for setting those low is because of other things that might get introduced to your network as you're building the network out, and those things might be a clock, and you don't know they're a clock. And they start spewing out, and they're set to 127 over 127. Da 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 da. You know, you, your domain's the same. Your priority one, priority two, both 128. So he's domain 127. He's 128 over 128. You left yours the same way. Now there is a unique thing here that if you set these numbers the same and you set those numbers there's the same, there is a tiebreaker. Typically, the MAC address is the tiebreaker. So now the lowest MAC address is going to win. It just took who's the grandmaster out of your hands, and you have no idea what's going on, and you think this guy's the grandmaster, and you lost him, and you yank him out, but he was the grandmaster. That was online. <laughs> you need to know. You need to be in control of this. Clocks and, and an IP address and say who's got what role? 
How do you know this? Okay. Well, the grandmaster will be reported through the system. You'll get his MAC address. His MAC address. Huh? No. Does your little box there reveal the secret? But of course. <laughs> and you should be able to exercise your network and do exactly this and watch it happen. And you'll see it going. You'll just see just a little bit of change in the phase delay. But you'll see the MAC address roll to a different MAC address. It's still staying locked. And everybody just keeps right on going. That's when things work right. <laughs> so if you only have one grandmaster, not two, and you lose your GPS, is there anything internal to the clock that will allow it to continue to slew? No. Or well, loop, or oh, you mean inside these guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's going to be a buyer beware. Yeah. We've got an oven control crystal. Yeah. We've got a one ppm clock. We're going to stay accurate for a month. Yeah, customers still have to do the due diligence that they've always had to do when buying safe generators. Do you want to yeah. do with one or do you want yeah. to do right. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So the nice thing about it, and then we also have, well, it's primarily on the, the black side, but uh, we've also got this feature called Stay Gen Lock that if you drop gen GPS to it, yeah, you take a slight drift and put it back on. It doesn't do a 360 whirl to go find it again. It's going to gently go backwards or forwards within empty drift spec and walk itself back in. So no audio hue, no color hue. Now we've got two settings. You can cut that time down because that time is incredibly slow. But we, so we've got a fast, fast slew and you still don't see color change. You still don't hear audio slew. And then the third is you can come in at two in the morning and go jam phase. <laughs> so, so what's happening the time when you have your yeah. grandmaster when you have your grandmaster lock the black first? You mentioned that a minute ago. What yeah. happens? What do you mean? In terms of time accuracy, you're not. Locked. Oh yeah, you're down about seven steps. Yeah. And the consequences of that uh, in a normal facility? It's just gonna be. Moving around more. If you're a standalone facility, it probably doesn't much matter. But if you're needing to talk to another another city, for example, let alone another country, yeah. you're going to want to do GPS log. Gotcha. Well, if your box would you know go to accounting inside the go, then that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Epoch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, most everybody's got routines in them. We're, we're good for 15 years. <laughs> We've got them calculated out for 15 years and we know how to ha handle the Epoch role. So, yeah. Yes, sir. How would, um, would IGMP snooping affect the PDP? Uh... IGMP snooping better be turned on. Because you, yeah, I mean, you're going to flood everybody if you don't. So you want to be in control of those ports because otherwise it is multicast. Multicast says, I'm coming in, I'm going to go to everything. So, yeah, IGMP snooping should be turned on. So now you have to do a request or a join to cross that. Um, so here I'm actually logged in, uh, believe it or not, wirelessly. 
Um, and here is my PTP time, my phase lag. So this is the amount that PTP is changing constantly. And I'm only going from there to there. <laughs> but you're wireless. No. I'm wireless logged into that screen. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm, I'm coming through a little itty bitty Cisco switch here. Now I am going in on an RJ, I'm coming out on 10 gig. Um, so you can see it jumped up, coming back. Here is my MAC address of the Grandmaster. I only have one here. And then uh, steps removed. How many things have I gone through to get here? One switch. So one of the other unique things uh, we have found at some of the uh, things that have gone on on uh, testing all these products is people do not take care of their TTLs. TTL is what? Time to, Time to live. Believe it or not, they saw just last week a whole bunch of TTLs set to zero which means it's spewing out of the device, the first switch it hits, it's gone. They had four or five switches in tandem and they had a lot of TTLs set to one. It was coming out of the first switch, but that was it. So yeah, it was weird. But so you can see I set my domain at 14. I dropped it down to a random low number. No. That's, that's my domain for the clock. The TTL is part of what's on the IP packet, your time to live. How many hops can you go through before it disappears in the ether? Huh? That's going to be hardware. That's going to be baked into the equipment. Typically, most gear you can't change it. And a lot of them are one, like 127 TTLs. But they saw some really weird things. <laughs> um, priority one was 35. Clock class was six. Accuracy less than 100 nanoseconds. I can't hit that top one with GPS, but I can pick the second one. Clock variance. And let's see what else we got. So what is clock variance measured? Um, how much it's, how much the clock is changing, the, the max that the clock has gone through. But what are those? Yeah, what's I have no idea. Code? Okay. I didn't write the code. Uh, <laughs> but what their window is that they're measuring that over. Better. Is it sample? Yeah, it's over a period of time. The, the big one, though, is this one up here. How much is that guy walking around? <clears throat> and I do know that now this is, you know, just a little itty bitty, you know, simple office switch with actually 10 gig uplink ports. And I'm actually using the 10 gig ports <laughs> as <laughs> routers. Uh, but bridging from 1G into 10G, that number is larger than it is if I put in a copper spigot in here and I actually go in and on 10G port and I stay within the 10G realm, that number goes down. Now, that, that's a common office switch. We were just... Yeah, uh, there, there's, yeah that, that guy, there's, there's no priorities going on in that thing. There's no, no that's just a... Uh, uh, so you got to remember... So I'm, I'm working on now... Uh, purchased one Cisco switch and then Cisco said that this other switch was better at uh, the PTP2. And yeah, because, uh, well, I'm sure it's changed, but uh, until recently there was only three switches Cisco had that knew 2059. Yeah. Every switch Arista has but three know 2059. Okay. So Cisco's trying to scramble and catch up. It's a good product, but they, they were a little behind on the PTP side. It was that, um, you saw that most of their switches did, it was on the PTP that they were lacking. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, I heard her. Okay. And I, yeah, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> we can have an offline yeah. conversation. But uh, then my priority too is 128 here, and I am my clock. Yeah. Classes, is there, GPS. Is there any alerting methodology that you can use here to determine whether you're out of spec in your phase lag? Uh, not yet. Uh, we are going to be coming up with the ability to set traps. Right now, you can pull this data. So there is a complete API for virtually anything you see on the front screen you can go grab from the back. But you'd have to go grab it right now. We, we don't have, yeah, not yet. So, and we're looking at what is, what are people going to want? So there's a couple of HTTP push protocols out there, and I know one of them what we're going to end up doing is <coughs> an old S and T traps. Yeah. Will this look at different uh, clocks on your system, like your slave or your? It is uh, well. Tell, it is it is a slave. So it's looking at what. I am seeing at this point in the network. So wherever you place this, it becomes a slave at that point in the network. So you could look here in your network, you could look here, you could look here, you could look here. But you gotta move well, the cable. But you, you gotta move the cable. <coughs> move the cable. Have, oh, okay. Or move the box. Well, because it is a slave. Yeah. So basically it's, it's like you're you're Yeah, there's there's no way to tell what's going on anywhere else easily. Yeah, but you you'd I'm sorry? Is it being through? You'd go to no. the uh, the clock. Yeah, it's yeah. Especially if it's on the switch. Yeah. Yeah. So I've I've got two ten gig SFPs, so I can look at two different streams. I can have PTP on either one. I can have dash six coming in, and I'll switch, and I'll tell you what the variance is between those two. Uh, and it does have uh, four uh, PNCs on it. Two of them are twelve G. Uh, so we can do all that fun stuff. So it is, you know, giving me, giving me pictures here. Uh, but if we kind of look up here, timing is not, is that timing bouncing around with? You know? That's what you don't want to see. <laughs> that is a free running source. I am locked to PTP. That's what a free running source looks like coming into you that is not like PTP. So this is looking at your path one. Yeah. Can I like 50? Yeah. But notice the way the timing is bouncing around. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Because the, the, videos, the videos being created just spewing the stuff out. And PTP is coming in saying, hey, you should have been here. Hey, you should And it's going, no, I was here. No, hey, I was here. No, I was here. Looks just like an unreferenced uh, video signal. It is unreferenced video signal. It's exactly what it is. But what is the actual picture information look like? Is it unlocked too? Is it no. No, because most receivers don't have to be locked. I mean, you know, especially from a picture monitor or a waveform monitor perspective. It just it's gonna grab the signal and lock to it. So So Yeah, it, it only becomes consequential when you try to mix that signal with another switch. Signal. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Frames. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you you are never gonna find line four. Switch on. Hmm. <laughs> Unless you frame sync it. And then you just added a boatload of delay. Okay, yes, sir. In the previous screen, looking at the time it was decrementing down from like minus 17,000. Yeah. And it seemed to be getting more and more accurate. Does that say that the source is getting more and more in sync with my... It's just going to cross over it and keep going out the other side. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it just, which side of the, that's, it's, it's going to be some almost sine wave type of drift, and it's just going to drift across where I'm at, and it's going to drift back where I'm at, and it's going to drift across where I'm at. So you're just going to see that increment, decrement, increment, decrement, because it's within a range. It does have its own clock. It is, you know, being created close to exactly what I am, but this guy's absolutely locked. 
And this guy's going, well, my oscillator's not quite as good as you are, so I'm just kind of wandering around here. <laughs> so I do have multiple signals coming in uh, on both port one and port two. These blue boxes is the 10 gig pipe. And this is how much I have coming in on the 10 gig pipe. Since I am not doing IGMP snooping, everything that's on that port is coming at me. One of the beautiful things in a troubleshooting mode is a source spews its signal out. The switch does the IGMP snooping off of that guy. So if that source is creating four signals on that stream, you plug a test device in, you're going to see all four of them sitting there. You don't even have to join them. Now you're going to have to set the box up because you need to tell it which one of those four I want to bring in and look at. So I need to know which multicast you want, and which port. But sources just spew the data out. It hits the switch. The switch does the snooping. So it says, oh, you're not going to go out the ports until somebody requests you. Once they do an IGMP join, then, oh, I will send it to you. So we do give you the data rates of what's going on, give you the destination. Here's the multicast address. We actually will give you the source address, and then there's a boatload of other data going on. Uh, ah, guess who he is? What's that one? Video. Video. 1.094. Not one. So that's what's left over. So, uh, 30. Audio. And 2.768 is going to be two channels. Because just a fraction, about a touch over 2 megabits is raw two channel AES. You got to put the headers around it, so it's going to bump it up just a little bit. That one microsecond spacing. If you put this on 100 millisecond spacing, or 100 microsecond spacing, instead of one millisecond, uh, that goes up quite a bit. Uh, what do we got down here? PTP. Uh, we have, ah, oh, 2022-6. It's not 1.485 gigabits. It's going to be bigger, right? No, well, 1.485's got all that in it, but now it's got the packets around it. So you got all that header data. So that's going to be your header data. The standard now supporting AES3. Now you've got a uh, Ravina or a Dante network in there, and how is that going to relate to that? Those guys don't pay PTP well. They do, they do PTP version 1. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, and not Senti profile way back old. Yeah. They're one of the reasons that AES67 has some of the weirdness. <coughs> yeah, so you got to do like you do right now if you want to go across different formats. Right. you got to put a little box in there, a little blue box that goes... Exactly, but the current Dante box to talk AS67 talks yeah. AS67, it doesn't talk AS3, I don't think. No. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Raw AES3, which is usable for a variety of professional applications, as well as dealing with compressed data, is why we have part 31. And I suspect your software upgrade for this box coming with uh, support for 31, or is it? Oh, but way? of course. Um, I don't know. I had, this is a beta load in here. Uh, it's the predecessor coming up for NAB, okay. and I honestly don't know if it's in there yet. It was not our our release. It's on the web. It does not. What does but we will. Mean? We are. I mean, that's definitely on our map because we're going to support all Dolby. We got to support it. Support Dolby. <coughs> so here's here's all the data from port two, and you can see the data that's coming in off of port two. 
So one of the other things that we can do in here is I can do PTP graphs. So here is the master, the slave, the leg. Come on now. I knew I should have backwrote this thing. <laughs> and here is the slave master delay. We're taking some hits going backwards. <laughs> now, typically, um, PTP, there's no set algorithm of how you do the packets. There's two typical different ways to do this. And the biggest one I've seen pretty much most people talk about is the lucky packet algorithm. And basically you create in software a very small window of the packets that you like, and those are all the lucky packets. The packets that fall outside of that window, you just skip over. <laughs> and you just keep going down the lucky packets. And you throw the outliers away. So those big spikes, you just go, and they're gonna process you and you just keep going down the middle of the, the lucky packets. Well, now, at least you're not going to. Well, then I'll control you over here. But, you know, the, the, one of the beautiful things now with, you know, newer technology, this is basically an RDM session into the box. Um, this is my laptop, so I'm not even plugged into the back of the box with the HDMI. So, you know, we can do, you know, the normal everyday stuff. So if you want to see the waveform, there's the video waveform. Uh, you know, we can turn around and gain it up. We can move it around. I can slide it around. I can change horizontal, vertical positions. It's getting more, uh, you know, of that type of stuff. Video. Yeah. So. Huh? Hmm? The eye patterns for SDI. Yes. Yes. That's the, the SDI eye pattern. Is the Mac address so long because it's like two hundred and six? Hmm. No. Yeah. That's a normal Mac address. Mm -hmm. So zero eight zero zero one one is Techtronix. So the first three oh, will tell you who they are. Mm -hmm. And. So you can tell who you're locked to, and you can actually go on Google and give them the first three octets, and they'll say, oh, yeah, that is it. Oh, yeah, that is this. Oh, that is a no. So if... Here. Let's call that, uh, what was the Holmes input? <laughs> that was my input. That, that's your unlocked. Um, yes. So there's that pattern. So I noticed there's an IP generator in this, and that's an option that you can yes. do. Yes. Yes. Uh, create a 2110 or 22. Dash. Yeah, so this is its internal SDI generator. This is a 6 gig output. I can do 270, 1.5, 6 gig, 12 gig, and the I pattern will go through all of them. And the usual selection of test patterns? Not yet. Not yet. I mean, but it will. Right now it's bars. The, but it is the nice thing about it, you buy it, you've already paid for it all, it's free upgrade. It's just as things roll out, uh, will come. This one. Like a volume meter too? Yes, sir. 
Uh, let's go back to oh, this input here. And so this is going to go based on uh, what you what you tell it. This is a 2022 dash uh, or 2110 input, so it knows it's getting level A. So if it's getting level A, it's not going to go past eight yeah. bars. If it's all level C, that C, 16 bars sitting there. Now, if we go SDI, you're going to see 16 bars. Is there any kind of visual uh, audio channel ID? Like a pulse or something? No. Oh, on the generator? On the generator? Yeah. Yeah, not right now. All that's coming. We're going to put a preset in there for the normal waterfall that people like, so that you can see a slope. So you can see when you got out of channel, you know, when they're out of out of place. So yes, that will all be coming. Let me go and change something here. I think did I not put? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just bars right now. Let me go check something here. Oh, I don't want you. I want you. Oh, that's local scaling. No wonder it's having issues. There it all is. Um, so, um, believe it or not, I can log into my buddy's unit in Atlanta, and it looks almost as good and this fast coming across to my house. From Atlanta. This is running about 15 megabits, 20. It's just HTML5 in the browser. This this one is HTML5. We also support uh, BNC okay. because uh, your iPad and a lot of Apple devices don't support HTML5 correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to VNC. So we've got twin in there. So it's a different port. This is port 6080, and I believe it's uh, 7080. I think okay. for the I huh. Not I don't think so. I'd have to go back and look for, for which one you want. Here's an old video engineer question. Yes, sir. Um, so we're, you know, for years used to dealing with, with stress tests. Yes, sir. Pathological test signals. Yes, sir. How would that relate in the, the IP world? You know, so would you create a test signal that, that is blasting packets or a complex signal? Or it would be more gapping the data to to max out either the 10 gig buffer modeling or the receiver buffer modeling to see how they see if you're overdriving your buffer. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and how the how the switches and then the rest of the network is. Mm -hmm. Going with that, so you'd be spacing your packets out yes. wider. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If so, you want something like that, you can propose a project to something. And yes. Staff it. There, 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 there is a couple com companies out there that make products. Packet Storm okay. makes products that do that. They're right. pretty, mm -hmm. pretty expensive, yeah. but the old they're familiar two color. Thing, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> doesn't doesn't care. So. If you look here, so what this is, this is a pit histogram. So packet inner arrival time. This is how often packets are coming. Down here, you're going to see two spikes really close. And space way over here, you see two more spikes. Guess what this gap is? That's the horizontal interval. This is the first packet of this stuff after this is done. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of the packets all come at this time. Then it goes horizontal interval. Oh, first packet. And then I'm back back here. We can go in, we can zoom in, because one of the nice things, at least on linear, is to go in and you know zoom in 
on this stuff and start looking at its shape. It should be very Gaussian mm -hmm. in nature. And when a switch gets overworked, rather than having a little bit of a Gaussian shape to this, it starts getting very flat topped and gets shoulders typically on it. The problem is, guess what software looks like? Exactly that. And that was what I was talking about when they created and allowed software senders. It took all of your looking at your network and seeing what the performance of your network is because you put a software sender on there, it looks like the network's broke because it's spread out so much. We've used this for years in, on the compressed side for MPEG. You can tell a network issue in a heartbeat when a switch is overstressed and it can't keep up because that Gaussian shape just broadens out, starts getting shoulders on it, and just starts spreading out rather than being a nice, you know, haystack. And uh, so we can go in and look. So if the switch starts getting really stressed, you're going to see field one and field two. Ding, 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 ding. If it was progressive, I'd only have one. <laughs> You'd just start seeing this stuff just really spread out. And it goes from a nice Gaussian shape, and then it gets squattier, squattier, fatter. <laughs> and most of the time, it'll get a shoulder on it and a hump and another shoulder on it. And you're starting to get where you're pushing the boundaries of what's going on. And it was real easy to use this stuff to be able to see what was happening in my network. And now you get a box that's generating an IP and it's just a pure software box doing it all in software. And it's like, okay, I can't use that anymore. <laughs> that's where we got to go back to the other buffer tests and be able to look at those things. So this is video to PTP offset. Why is it doing that? Somebody said something. It's not locked. It's not locked. What we see in the bouncing ball, right? The cross point. This is the, just a linear graph of that same thing, but just a graph over time of where am I? And I can look at the audio aspect, I can look at the data aspect, if there is any data, which there isn't on this one. Well, go back to your so. video screen and note your lower video to RTP offset. Yeah. Flat. Yeah. And big. Yes. <laughs> we may not count past that. Hmm. Now, if I change inputs, Now, this is a, uh, an issue we just discovered. Uh, every, everybody knows about beta code, right? <laughs> that dude should be sitting about over here. <laughs> um, but you'll see that it is doing what? Just, it, it is wobbling, but remember the phase lag was wobbling a little bit. It's going to have that little bit of phase light. This is locked. So this signal is locked. And the nice thing about it, it's a lot like SDI. SDI didn't have to hit the dead center. It just needed to fall within that zone that things would lock, right? Basically a rectangle box around that zone. What you don't want is that ping pong ball bouncing all over the screen. You know exactly I am locked. I can't phase it in. So if this went through a lot of networks or I was going through products that were killing the network, you might get something that gets delayed if they aren't taking care of it. And we look over at the uh, video to RTP over there. So video or video to PTP. The timing now gives me some, some real data in it. 
because this is now locked and it's not going off into Never Never Land. So I was in a grass menu and it said that the uh, window for the IP input was 16 microseconds. That's easy to achieve? Yeah. Okay. And normally what you're going to see on this is this thing is going to be delayed on HD by typically 44 lines because it's raster data only. 44 lines ago, the actual real frame started, didn't it? So it's, the frame still started up here, but I'm only sending data from here down. So it's going to be off from where the actual frame in the, in the real world started. But it should sit there. And one of the critical things of, on this guy is where am I against analog? And are they locked? When you say analog, your black reference coming in? Yes. Okay. Black or tri -level. tri -level. So this is, and that is what you want to see. Those two should be sitting and not moving at all. Now, I can move black around, can't I? Yeah. So I could move black and dead zero it, or I could move black out and make it exactly on top of the 44. I can't move PTP. It's where it's at. Yeah, which you, you didn't mention anything about the epoch. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, that's just a, a time back in, what, 1970? Yeah, 1970. Yeah, okay. and it's number of seconds counted out from then to now. Yeah. And it's going to roll, roll over in, what, next Friday or something? Uh, I just forget. No, that's really um, one of the yeah. sub-counters. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, yeah. So there's, the epoch will roll. GPS will roll, so there's different things we got to account for, and it's all done in the firmware of the receivers. They all know about it, what to do. Some of them. Well, <laughs> yeah. And most companies like us, we don't make the GPS receiver. We buy it from somebody. But we've gone back to them and said, okay, how are we? And they go, yeah, you're good for the next 15 years. So we know where, where we're at. But this is one of the really, really handy, handy things, is to be able to make sure, because let's face it, you're going to be taking data in off black, you know, off of SDI, which is reference to black, getting it into your core routing, and at some point, some of it's going to go back out black again, so go back out SDI again. There are devices that are going to be referenced to yeah. analog. Yep. Okay, I have gone, I think, long enough. There is a boatload more measurements. There's measurements on the actual 10 gig link itself that go through all the buffer management. I can tell you, I can show you actual runs of those two buffers. We actually show the graphs of how those two buffers are handling themselves. So there's a lot of data that we've put in this box on the IP side because that's the piece nobody has to get gear out and make things this stuff work. So, so like the real basic stuff like jitter, packet loss, oh yeah, packet delay. Oh yeah. Well these, yeah, we're going to give you packet delays. Um, so here's all the layer one, layer two data. Here's all of the raw layer three through layer seven data. Just getting the stuff in the door. We do the same for audio, do the same for video, PTP. So yeah, from a raw IP, yeah, we give you layer layer one through layer seven, and then take the last two layers, the you know, the elements themselves and tear them apart. Can you do he header analysis as well? No. But the thing that we do have is capture. And if you click right there, that captures PCAP. The nice thing about it, this is a true 10 gig box. 
I don't care how full the 10 gig pipe is, it'll capture however much up to up to 2 gig. Our max is 2 gig. But we're taking it off the DSP, so we're not dropping anything. Perfect timestamps. Yeah, so you put a USB 3 USB in the back of this thing. We turn around, grab it off DSP, put it into RAM, shovel it to the SSD, and then shovel it out to the USB stick. Yeah, because if you've ever tried to do this on a, on a laptop and on a 10 gig pipe, yeah, good luck. Sorry, sir. Well, thank you very much. So, thank you guys for sticking around. I hope it was useful information, useful data. But thank you for sticking around as I. Thanks very much. And um, remember, we had a launch of our student chapter last month. So, any students? Anybody students? No? Oh, you're all employed. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, well, enjoy any of you going. And, yeah. Um, if anybody's got questions, you want to come up, touch it, play with it. If you want to log into it, it'll give you the password. You just look at Prism on the line. You can log into the thing. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. There's still some food left, so grab Yeah, we've got business cards up here if anybody wants one. Well, thank you. All right. Not as enthusiastic.